Good evening. My talk tonight is entitled The Global Brain. And what I want to do is to focus on some of the important shifts which I see are underway in the world today. What I want to start with is this image. The image of the planet as seen from space. It's a very powerful image. For many people it's a very magic image. It's an image which conjures up feelings of wholeness, oneness, feelings of connection. It's also an image which had a very deep effect on the first astronauts who were out there in space when they first looked back and saw the planet. Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon, described it as an experience of instant global consciousness. He said, when you're up there, you're no longer an American citizen or a Russian citizen. Suddenly, all those boundaries disappear and you're a planetary citizen. And what's really interesting is that most of the astronauts came back changed from that experience. They saw that not only was it a very beautiful, magical looking planet, but also they became increasingly aware that all was not well down there. And they came back wanting to help in some way or another. It's not the astronauts who are the only ones who are deeply affected. I think many of us, when we first saw pictures such as these, had a very deep effect on us. I just want you to think back for a moment to when you first saw pictures of these and try if you can remember what sort of feelings they conjured up for you. I really believe that pictures like these are in some senses the spiritual symbol of our time. Now that may sound strange because we're used to spiritual symbols as being very simple things, things you could draw with a stick in the sand. But I think with today's technology we can actually have spiritual symbols of this sort of complexity. If you think about it, the essence of a spiritual symbol is that it's a symbol of wholeness, of oneness. And it's this wholeness which is reflected in this picture of the planet and it symbolizes the whole ecological movement, concern about planetary resources, concern about the third world, the whole issue of peace. These are all issues of concern to the whole of humanity. Another realization which many of the astronauts got was looking back at the Earth, it looked as if maybe the whole thing was some single living organism. And that may sound strange to us, because normally we've only seen the planet from close up. Even when you're up five miles up in a plane, you're still seeing a very tiny part of it. And I think in some respects, we've been like fleas living on an elephant. If you can imagine these fleas living on an elephant, they, being rather scientific fleas, have studied the skin, measured how deep it is, looked for the sweaty bits, found the hairy bits, generally mapped out the elephant. Then one day, one of these fleas takes this huge leap off, 50 feet away, and looks back at this thing called an elephant, and suddenly says, could it be that an elephant is actually a living organism in its own right? And I think it's very much a parallel shift that has happened to us. We've been taking this huge leap back from 50 miles to 100 miles till eventually we see the planet in its wholeness. And the question comes, could planet Earth be a single living organism? And this is not just a vision which occurred to the astronauts. It's something which many scientists today are beginning to take quite seriously. People like Jim Lovelock in England have been looking at some of the long-term changes which have happened to the planet. One of the first things they looked at was temperature. Now, if you look at the temperature of the planet over the whole of its history, you find that it started off fairly high and cooled rapidly over the first 500 million years or so. And then once it reached that crucial range between those two dotted yellow lines, it seems to have remained steady. 
Now that's strange, because theoretically, it should either have gone up again following the red line, or gone down a bit more following the blue line, and then gone up again. But it didn't do either of these things, it stayed constant. And what seems to have happened is that all the living systems together released the right amounts of the right sorts of gases to counteract changes in the sun's output. So the net effect was a constant temperature. Now I say that sounds strange, but it's no stranger than the fact that our own bodies sweat when we're hot, shiver when we're cold, doing exactly the same thing, maintaining the best conditions for our continued existence. Another example they've been studying is the amount of salt in the sea. Now salt, as you know, is being continually washed off the land into the sea at such a rate that every 80 million years or so, it would reach its present concentration, which means over the history of the planet, the whole history of the planet, it would reach this level many times over. But again, it hasn't. It seems to be steadied out. And the only way of explaining this is that somehow the organisms in the sea absorb just the right amount of salt to keep it constant. And there's now something like 24 different examples of things like this, which shows that the planet seems to behave like some huge self-regulating system. And this is what scientists call the Gaia hypothesis, spelled G-A-I-A, after this lady, who is the Greek Earth Mother Goddess, Gaia. Looking at it, we might imagine that the heartbeat of the Earth are days and nights, the seasons of the Earth are her breast. The tropical rainforests are rather like livers in function. The atmosphere and the oceans are like the circulatory systems. So if the Earth is a living system, a living organism in its own right, the question arises, what are we doing here? What's humanity doing here? To get some perspective on it, I want to go back and actually consider the whole of evolution. Now, according to current scientific theory, the universe started with some big bang. Pure energy, light. In the beginning, there was light. Something science and religion actually agree upon. Then this pure energy rapidly condensed into the first elementary particles, electrons, protons, things like that. Over time, these very simple particles began collecting together to form the first simple atoms, hydrogen, helium, which then, over millions, billions of years, began collecting together to form more complex atoms, and more complex atoms, until the whole of chemistry had evolved. The next stage was these complex atoms coming together themselves to form molecules. First simple molecules like this, an amino acid, and then over time forming much more complex molecules, things like this, DNA, the basis of life. These huge molecules, each containing millions of atoms, then began to collect together themselves to form the first simple living organisms bacteria, algae, very simple organisms. Over time, these two collected together to form more complex cells and then multicellular organisms. Cells coming together to form simple organisms, sponges, corals, things like that. And then we enter the more familiar story of evolution, moving up through various creatures in the sea, until we get to fish. Now, fish are very interesting in the whole story. They present a very significant stage in evolution. Because with fish, the nervous system is encased in bone, in the skull and spinal cord. Which means that the nervous system, for the first time ever in evolution, was protected. And the main thrust of evolution from then on has actually been in the development of the nervous system. Clearly, as we move on up from fish through various reptiles, mammals, our bodies have changed. 
We've lost our gills. Our fins have changed into arms and legs. But if you look at it, the most important change is actually in terms of the nervous system. It's that which has changed the most. It has got more and more complex. And so today, we find some of the most complex nervous systems known on the planet. It's interesting, the nervous systems of dolphins and whales are much more complex than ours, which suggests they might be more intelligent. Though what they actually do with their increased capacity, we don't know. Anyway, tonight, I don't want to focus on dolphins and whales. Tonight, I want to focus on the second most complex nervous system on this planet, the human nervous system. What's fascinating about human consciousness is that it's become reflective, which means that we are able to look back upon ourselves and upon the universe. Whether we're studying a piece of wood, a leaf, or looking out at the stars, what we're really doing is being the universe studying itself. We've come on this long evolutionary journey out of energy, out of the stars, and we've reached this crucial stage of complexity where we can look back upon the universe. So in some senses you could say that the human being is a star's way of looking at stars. And it's not only on the outer plane that this reflective nature happens. When we turn our attention inwards, whether through meditation or some other process, and start looking down towards the deeper levels of our own soul, we are again the spiritual side of the universe beginning to investigate itself. So what is the next stage of evolution? I don't think it's necessarily growing bigger brains or disappearing hands. That may be happening in the very long term, over millions of years. But I think there's another development happening which fits in with the whole logical process of evolution. And that is individual human beings beginning to link together into clusters, into groups of human beings. This picture is of a village in Denmark. What's interesting is that the pattern you see here, the way the streets are organized, is very, very similar to the way the first multicellular organisms developed in the sea. This is Sun City, Arizona. The pattern here is very similar to a growing fetus. And I think this tendency of people coming together into larger units is something we're seeing happening at a much higher level. The union of the states in the USA, the coming together of the EEC in Europe, it's a worldwide tendency. I think this is the natural drift of evolution, which is going to go on until the whole planet begins to come together and starts functioning as one single community. Now this is just the physical side of this networking. There are also deeper levels. There's a linking together of minds. Through the whole information explosion, we're beginning to connect together mentally, to exchange information wherever we are. Through the birth of things like computer networks, people are beginning to link up mind to mind. We are beginning to link mentally as well as physically. And there's a third level of linkage, which I'll look at in greater depth in a minute, which is a linking consciously, a linking at a much deeper level, a linking of soul to soul. So this, I see, is the next stage of evolution, humanity beginning to link together physically, mentally, and spiritually, beginning to work and function on many different levels as one single system. Now, there are some interesting evolutionary parallels in the way systems have linked in the past. If we go back in evolution and look at the evolution of life from matter, it seemed to take about 10 billion atoms to produce living cells. 
the actual figure 10 billion doesn't have to be exact. We're talking about orders of magnitude. What this figure seems to represent is the number of units you need to gather together, number of atoms, in order for there to be sufficient complexity for life to emerge. If we look up at the next level, the evolution of consciousness, human consciousness, out of living systems, you find it takes about the same number of nerve cells, 10 billion nerve cells in the human brain, before we get the sort of reflective consciousness characteristic of humanity. Now, if this pattern continues through evolution, it would suggest that the next stage, the emergence of some planetary organization out of human consciousness, we would need something of the order of 10 billion consciousnesses on the planet. Now, in terms of numbers, we're already basically there. Human population at the moment is just approaching 5 billion, which is within the right ballpark, it's the right sort of size. Now, there's some interesting parallels between the way that humanity, if you like, the global brain of planet Earth is developing, and also the way the human brain develops in the fetus. Your own brain develops somewhere between weeks 8 and 13 after conception. If you imagine yourself to be a nerve cell in your own brain, at first there was plenty of space. Then, very quickly, there was this massive population explosion of nerve cells. And if you were a nerve cell, you'd probably think, hell, this is getting dangerous. There's not enough oxygen to go around. We're going to get short of blood soon. But what happens is, suddenly, week 13, the explosion stops. And from then on, the whole process, the development of the nervous system, is the growth of complexity, the growth of connectivity between these nerve cells. I think what we are seeing is a similar process happening on the planet. We've had this massive population explosion, but it's now beginning to level out. And we're moving into the next stage, which is the linking, the linking of the human cells in this planetary brain. It's occurring through things like postal systems, telephones, computer networks, satellites, all of this is increasing the connectivity and linkage of the cells in the global brain. Now, all that I've spoken of so far, you could say is the good news. The bad news is that our rapid development is also threatening the welfare of the planet. In some respects, we seem to be like a planetary cancer. It's interesting that if you take a photograph of a city from the air and look at the way the city spreads out into the environment, it's very reminiscent of the way a cancer grows in the body. Now this picture, it may look like LA from the air. It's not. It's actually a cancerous tissue in the human body. But just look at it. Get a feel for the structures, how they're growing. And then compare it with this. Now, the similarity is more than just a simple visual parallel. If we go back and look at what causes the cancerous tendency in the individual and what causes the same tendency in society, we find that underneath are very similar principles. Looking at the individual first, an individual cell in the human body. Those white squiggles in the middle are the genes, the genetic information. It's the genes that make you a single living organism rather than just a bowl of biological soup. And it's when they get disturbed, they no longer tie the system together, and individual cells become selfish, rogue cells, going off doing their own thing at the expense of the body. If we look up at the next level, the human being, the cell in society, what we see performs a parallel function to the genes is now in our own consciousness. It's that deepest level of self. 
what mystics might call the soul. And it's that which seems to tie us together. And when that is not experienced, when we're not in touch with that experience of the deepest level of self, we become like rogue cells, beginning to function selfishly, out of touch with the needs of the system as a whole. Now this way of functioning is what Alan Watts referred to as the skin encapsulated ego. The idea that what's inside the skin is me, what's outside the skin is not me. Now, biologically, that's okay. We are surely unique individuals. But the point is, it's not the whole truth. It's not the fullest depth of our identity. And the danger comes when we do take it to be all that we are, our sole identity. The reason people do this is because the real self, the pure self, is actually very hard to grasp. Trying to grasp that deeper level of oneness is very much like trying to describe a hole in a piece of wood. If you ask people to describe a hole such as this, they'll start saying, well, it's a round hole. You say, yes. And they say, it's fairly smooth and it's red. You say, hang on. The hole isn't red. The hole isn't smooth. And they say, aha, the hole's black. But no, that's the background and suddenly they're stuck. What's the whole? How do you describe the whole itself? And suddenly people realize you can't describe that. And it's almost exactly the same with our own wholeness. Wholeness with a W this time. Because it's so very hard to grasp, we tend to describe our own wholeness in terms of what surrounds it. Our many possessions. On a subtle level, the roles we play, our social status. Subtler still, and even more dangerous, our beliefs, both scientific and religious. It also turns out that much of the way we mistreat the environment comes back to the fact that we see the world as separate from ourselves. Consequently, we take fairly good care, and I say fairly good, fairly good care of what's inside the skin, but we don't care nearly so well for what's outside the skin. We often end up misusing the world in order to feed our own limited sense of identity. The late Gregory Bateson said something very powerful about this. He said, if this, meaning this me versus you model, if this is your estimate of your relationship to nature and you have an advanced technology, your likelihood of survival will be that of a snowball in hell. You will die either the toxic byproduct of your own hate or simply by overpopulation or overgrazing. And Bateson went on to say that if I am right, the whole of our thinking of what we are, what other people are, has got to be restructured. The most important task today is to learn to think in a new way. I would actually go a step further and say the most important task is to be in a new way, to experience, to be conscious in a new way. We need to make the shift from this, the skin encapsulated model of the self, to this. what Gene Houston calls leaky margins. The boundaries are still there, but they're much less solid. In addition, we now see that the outside world is the same as ourselves. It is this shift of consciousness, this shift of being, which I believe underlies the next stage in the whole evolutionary process. If we just go back and briefly retrace what happened in evolution, we can see that each stage became the platform for the next stage. Thus, it will be through processes involving consciousness rather than life that we're going to see the next stage emerging. So the spearhead of evolution is now right up in there at the top, 
right up in there. Now, when we talk of our own inner development, we often loosely talk about it as inner evolution. And I think what is very important to realize is that this really is evolution, as it is now taking place on this planet. The evolutionary phase which we are now passing through is the evolution of the consciousnesses of the billions of people on this planet. In short, evolution has now become internalized. Now, not only does this seem to be the thrust of evolution, it is also the direction in which humanity seems to be moving. If you look at what's happened in the past, the major focus of human activity until 1900 or so was agriculture. And I'm talking about the West here. The majority of human working hours were spent on the land, and that was so up until 1900, when a new curve took over industry. From 1900 onwards, industry became the dominant use of human time. The industrial age had begun. And the industrial age continued until 1975, when a new curve took over, information processing. In terms of human activity, we are now very much in the information age. We've entered the information age much faster than anybody ever anticipated. And as you can see, the reason is the information curve is doubling very fast every six years, whereas industrial growth was only doubling once every 14 years. Now there's another curve, which at the moment is so low that it seems almost insignificant. But it is also so steep that you can't really fit it in on these axes. So, if we contract the axis a bit, we can see it as that pink curve on the end. And this curve refers to the growth of what I call consciousness processing. It's a measure of the number of people involved in the development of human potential, the development of the mind. And surveys carried out in this area suggest that the doubling time is about three to four years. And that's really significant because it may be very small at the moment, but the way in which it's doubling suggests that by the year 2000, it will have overtaken the information curve. What we would then see is a very major shift in values, as more and more people became aligned with that deeper experience of oneness, at the same time letting go of their individual pettiness, and beginning to function more in tune with humanity and the planet as a whole. Now the idea of there being deeper depths to the mind is not something new. It's the most ageless wisdom that humanity has ever had. So all around the world, in all ages, you find people talking of that same basic wisdom, that same basic understanding of life and consciousness. Here I've symbolized the idea of these different teachers at different times by different colored dots. But what happened once the teacher himself had gone was that the teaching was forced to spread by word of mouth or be written down on parchment. But the means of spreading wasn't very sound. So inevitably, as it began to spread out into the environment, it also began to become distorted and absorbed by the culture of the time. Now what is happening today is something very different. The same idea is cropping up again and again and again. What's particularly interesting is that as a result of the whole growth of technology and the information explosion in particular, one doesn't now have to go and sit under a Bodhi tree in India to begin to get to understand the value of enlightenment. We now have the technology to begin to communicate this vision around the planet to each other. But what, for me, is even more significant is that as it begins to spread out from all the many different centers, 
what now happens is that this wisdom, so to speak, meets itself coming back the other way. There's a feedback. Rather than dissolving, it builds up, leading eventually to this, a high synergy society. A society in which in many senses we become even more individual than we are now. And that I've symbolized by the people being of all different colors. This society will become even more individual and yet at the same time become linked together at the center, at the core of our consciousness by a planetary consciousness, a planetary awareness. And it's such a transition, which I think is really the way through the current crisis that humanity now finds itself in. If you go back and look at the Chinese symbol for crisis, Wei Qi, the first symbol means danger, beware. What's interesting is the second part means an opportunity for growth, for change, for something new. What we tend to do is get stuck on seeing crisis only as danger. This is valuable, but what is also needed at the present time is to begin to look at the opportunities inherent in the crisis. From an evolutionary point of view, crises are a challenge. They're a challenge to move on to something new, a challenge to adapt. And the current crisis is one of consciousness of shifting from our experience of ourselves as isolated beings to experiencing ourselves as part of this much larger system. And making that shift is the challenge we are now faced with. The challenge is, can we begin to make that shift en masse? Can we, as a species, begin to come together and work as one single system? which ultimately means, can we begin to experience that in ourselves? If we don't, we don't experience it, we're really just giving lip service to oneness and still going out into the world with a skin encapsulated pettiness. To finish, I'd like to quote Part of a very favorite poem of mine at the present time is from Christopher Fry's play, The Prisoner. The human heart may go the length of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. Frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the greatest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. But what are you waiting for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake? for pity's sake.